Dr. Crable has done us a good service in easing us into our creative and challenging and inviting topic for this year's Missiology Lecture, Global Arts and Witness in Multi-Faith Contexts. Representation and expression is core to our human existence, and it points to our Creator, who is the Creative One. In fact, He is the Creator. We come alive when we create and express ourselves to others. And when our expression connects with another, we just come alive. Of course, contrary-wise, we are never so far from another person who's actually right next to us, our neighbor, and when looking at an artistic piece means absolutely nothing to us and everything to them. It's so embarrassing. We might find it revolting. I think, for example, of the meaning of the swastika for Buddhists, but it means something very different for German Jews. You talked about a film, so I thought I'd talk about a film. I remember a Woody Allen film, actually quite a few of them, but I don't watch them anymore. This particular one was called Love and Death, where Woody Allen goes to an art gallery. <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> trying, to connect, <laughs> trying to connect with a young woman, they look at the same painting. Now, this is my paraphrase. I didn't go back and look it up, but I think I'm pretty accurate about this. Wow, he says, I see joy and life and future and hope. What do you see? Death, darkness, despair. <clears throat> so Woody Allen responds, what are you doing tonight? <laughs> <laughs> Committing suicide. <laughs> what about tomorrow night? <laughs> well, art, <laughs> artistic expression, Symbols expressed with our voice, instruments, our body, or in our media can connect us or they can divide us. Where is the Christian mission, the witness, pointing to the cross when others cannot understand or appreciate our movement or rhythm or our painting or our poetry? I have a friend, a missionary to China, who was going to write an introductory mission book. I wish he would. He's a very bright scholar. I know it'd be an excellent book. He said he was merely going to write about communication because God communicates to humanity, and that's really the essence of what Christian mission is. Mission is communication. The arts and language are communication, and so if we accept the premise that mission is at its core communication, we could say that mission is art or language or symbolic service. Crable's opening stories are very helpful. African Queen is a great mission story and a classic Hepburn movie, which we should all see. Most helpful for our introduction is Crable's quotation of the doubly anointed William Wade Harris's comment about songs of heaven. God has no personal favorite songs. He hears all that we say in whatever language. It is sufficient for us to compose hymns of praise to him with our own music and our own language for him to understand end quote. That was in the paper. I don't think you said it here, but that was in the paper. And yet, as any good Reformed theologian, or even a bad Reformed theologian, would tell you, every culture and the music and art of every culture is fallen from grace and in need of, and in fact can be, redeemed. So as Crable tells us, the Dita Zlangi music form, with its sexually suggested lyrics, is not appropriate for Christian praise. And following this section, Crable reminds us that the production of art in cultural forms and context, context must come out of a ubiquitous scriptural life. You didn't use that word, but I like it, to have a life that is so embedded, so uh, swimming in scripture all the time, that it's from that scriptural encounter that the arts are formed. The artist must be bathed in scripture so the very words of God will guide their meditation, and their meditation will overflow to expressions of the heart. I find this a very helpful reminder. Next, Crable identifies, at least in his paper, if not in his PowerPoint, the major elements that must be considered as part of our discussion these few days. These elements are arts in their many forms, 
ecclesio-denominational forms, the historico-political context, and the socio-religious religious realities. Attention to these variables helps us to understand how multiple artistic forms actually embody the good news. And yet, I might add, art and artistic expression has an element of mystery to it. It is not so easily analyzed and critiqued. How is it, as Crable tells us, that, quote, in reality, many Christians around the world came to genuinely cherish Euro-American music traditions and consider them as their own? I, Scott Sunquist, have heard Chin and Kachin and Yangon sing English hymns in local dialects with unusual harmony and with very unusual rhythm. But that was all they sang, English hymns. Those were their songs. How is it that I, a Swedish and Scotch-Irish American, you're probably wondering, find my heart music as black gospel music and Mozart piano sonatas? and I find that more inviting than Swedish Lutheran hymns. Part of this is certainly because we worship for 10 years in the east end of Pittsburgh. How is it that I like Char Kway Tiao more than Swedish meatballs? Why don't we have an organ, in the, an organ in the chapel, but we have a West African talking drum in the chapel? Hallelujah. What connects our heart to the heart of God is not rigid and uncompromising, but at times it's malleable and welcoming and inviting. And here is where I spin off the solid foundation of Crable's paper, which I look forward to uh, having published so others can use it. In 1989, I became the pastor of a Chinese English language congregation in Singapore, except for one Indian Sikh deacon and the white Euro-American pastor, myself, the whole congregation was made up of young people the average age of about 23 who were raised in dialect-speaking, not even Mandarin-speaking, but dialect-speaking homes, but who were English-language educated. They came to faith in their new heart language of English. The Mandarin-language congregation blessed us because they didn't get along well with English-language young people, gave us some money, and encouraged us to go out and find our own place to worship. We were now our own church, so I wrote a four-verse hymn for our new Covenant Presbyterian Church entitled, Our Covenant God. Following Calvin's Institutes, it was centered around God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the church. Good theology. Now we need good music. I invited a Chinese woman composer from Indonesia to compose something like the Yellow River Symphony, for a Presbyterian church. <laughs> you know where this is going. <laughs> she did a great job. It was beautiful. It was very, very Chinese, with piano and flutes and violin accompanied the debut We Became an Independent Congregation. It was a total failure. They couldn't even sing it. Now think about this. For thousands of years, these young people and their lineage had been part of the Chinese language art, and culture, but in less than 20 years of life, for some of them just for five or 10 years, of life in the English language, they had suddenly come to love Western music and Australian praise songs. They could not even sing a Chinese melody. Forget, enjoy it. Where was their heart, and therefore their heart language? In isolated villages or among localized ethnic Zomi Chin or Maasai or Fulani, it is still possible to encourage gospel expressions through bubbling up through local art forms. But migration and globalization and technology makes all of this much more complicated and mysterious today. So let's talk about mysterious. Or better yet, let's talk about the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. <laughs> he always falls asleep when I speak. And inspiration, and let's talk about migration as part of the themes of arts and mission. So for our discussion and reflection, I'd like to suggest the following questions. After I wrote this, I got the 10 questions that you were going to do. <laughs> so we just have lots of questions here today. First question you might want to think about is, how must we think differently about arts, faiths, and mission in urban areas as opposed to villages and communities 
that are more monocultural. When we think about continuation, correction, completion, and creation of artistic forms, by the way, I like those four, is there a sense in that we just know without analyzing, we just know that certain forms or patterns are inappropriate? Or is it a rational evaluation? We say, oh, no, that's not going to work there because that's too much of this. As a type of Christian checklist that guides us, I have a sense at times it's just intuitive. Thirdly, let me offer a simple guide that I use in thinking about worship, not simply about worship in the arts, but about worship. I think that what makes for genuine, deep, vital worship is continuity and and connection. Continuity with, with Scripture, continuity with the ancient church, continuity with the ecumenical church, and then connection with our context, a connection with our people, our neighborhood, our our, uh, our area. If we do too much of one, we end up with so much connection over here and may be completely irrelevant to our local context. So we're constantly struggling with these two issues and themes. I think that's what you get at with your four C's. I only have two. I can't quite hold four in my head at once. But I think that that's helpful to think about it with the arts. Is it communicating something really Christian that's connected to Scripture and the rest of the church? Or is it so, con so concerned about the context here, it becomes divisive, and it becomes so tribal that it divides us? Certainly, we know in our world today, we have plenty of that. And so we struggle in our globalization, and I think the arts can be an answer to this struggle. So I want to end again by just saying thank you so much for your presentation. You've given us a great foundation for these next two days. Thank you. Thank you.